right, let's go ahead and get started. I want to thank everyone for coming to this presentation. My name is Sherry Smart. I'm the medical director for Thermo Fisher Scientific, who develops and markets procalcitonin, a test that I think many people are becoming more and more familiar with in their practice. So we're very, very pleased today to have Dr. Greg Seaman from um, UC Davis presenting. He is a hospitalist that practices um, in the facility, and he actually graduated from UCLA, but did his residency at UC Davis, and I believe continued to practice there as a hospitalist. Is that correct? No. No? Um, UCSD, San UCSD. Diego. UCSD, okay. So we're really happy to have him. What um, I think is really valuable to this presentation is his specific interest in uh, community-acquired pneumonia and in high-value care, and I understand that he still teaches, or he does teach a class on high value care to his residents. And I think it's notable that he also has been um, named as one of San Diego's top physicians a couple of times. So we're very, very pleased to have him. He's going to present his experience and his interpretation of the data on procalcitonin in 2019, potential and pitfalls. Um, at the end, we should have a, few, a time for some questions, so we do have a microphone, but please uh, fill out your evaluation that's on your chair, and you can just leave them on your chair. That's very helpful to us in determining speakers and, and uh, topics going forward for other, for other conferences. So thank you, and we welcome uh, Dr. Seaman. Thank you, Sherry. Um, if you see Davis look like this, I might move there, but this is San Diego where I live and I'm very happy and proud to be part of UCSD. I am a hospitalist, like most of you. I'm not a basic scientist. Um, as far as disclosures go, as you heard from Sherry, this uh, talk is supported by Thermo Fisher, but these slides are, are all mine. So um, before we start, I want to, whoa. Wow, OK. I'd like to get to know the audience a little bit. How many of you have procalcitonin available to you at your place? OK, makes sense. That's why you're here. Um, I find that there's sort of procalcitonin lovers and procalcitonin haters. I guess my other disclosure here is that I'm a procalcitonin lover, so that's a bias of mine, but uh, I'll try to see if I can convince you of why that is the case. But asking you, um, how many of you uh, find procalcitonin to be helpful in your clinical practice? Okay, great. How many of you here are kind of struggling with how to use it and have trouble? Okay. Um, and how many of you were here because you thought it was the heart failure talk? Because that's somewhere else. Okay, let's go. So this isn't working for me. So today we're going to talk about um, the physiology of procalcitonin, just to kind of give you a little basis for why we're even looking at this as a hormone for antibiotic stewardship. We're going to talk about the clinical applications of procalcitonin where there's the best data, which is uh, lower respiratory tract infections and sepsis and talk about its role as a tool for antibiotic stewardship, which is important to all of us as hospitalists. Um, we'll talk about the limitations of the procalcitonin assay, both the limitations of the test itself and maybe something you haven't heard or read about as much, but something that at least I'm interested at UCSD. Whoa, got to turn off that mic. Uh, the limitations of the test as far as how we use it. Yes, it is. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. All right, at the end I'll be singing. All right, and lastly, we'll, we'll talk about um, some clinical scenarios where procalcitonin helps me in my practice and hopefully helps you. So antibiotic stewardship, hang on a second. Let's try again. Antibiotic stewardship, you're all hospitalists. I don't need to tell you a lot about the importance of antibiotic stewardship, but just so we're on the same page here, what I'm talking about is this is the kind of classic data from the CDC where they've pointed out to us that as, as half the antibiotics that we prescribe in the hospital are either unnecessary or inappropriate, drives antibiotic overuse, antibiotic resistance, C. diff rates, we're trying to get away from all that. So uh, if we have tools to improve our performance along the lines of antibiotic stewardship, we like to take care of them. This is just one of many campaigns. This happens to be the SHM fight the resistance campaign uh, that you've probably become familiar with that encourages us to do our best stewardship. 
But yet, as practitioners, we're faced with taking care of really sick patients with really bad infections that we know need antibiotics right up front, and we don't really have the tools to do this effectively sometimes. I'm talking about sepsis, I'm talking about significant community-acquired and hospital-acquired pneumonia that we take care of all the time, and we want to um, sort of um, balance the, the fact that we need to give early antibiotics uh, up front with the fact that we don't always have good information about which, which uh, times these are bacterial in nature. Our cultures are obviously not available to us when we first start taking care of these patients. And as we know, especially in pneumonia, the yield of cultures is pretty low, especially sputum and blood cultures. So what is a conscientious hospitalist to do? Well, it would be nice if we had some alternative biomarkers. Uh, we're familiar in cardiology, we use them all the time, biomarkers for infection that we could use to make earlier decisions about antibiotic use. We're all kind of familiar with some of these biomarkers like fever and leukocytosis, which are great. Um, as far as their sensitivity, they go up when patients have bacterial infections, but they also go up when patients have other forms of inflammatory disease, so they're, they're fairly specific, but they're not all that sensitive. Um, cytokines is what drive these. It's on the list here, but most of our uh, labs aren't routinely measuring cytokines, so those aren't things we use. We've come to rely a little bit more on CRP as a biomarker for infection, um, which is a little bit better than fever and leukocytosis, but not as specific um, as procalcitonin, which is particularly, you know, is limited to, it goes up with bacterial infection in particular and is not quite as sensitive to fluctuations due to uh, non-infectious So let's go through what this looks like in detail. Cutting in and out. Okay, so first of all, what is procalcitonin as a, as a hormone? This is gonna require you to go back to your med school, uh, phys class, because uh, you all probably remember that calcitonin is secreted by the C cells of the thyroid, the interstitial cells, and it helps regulate calcium secretion. Um, as you can see, here's a nice picture of a thyroid C cell where, um, like most hormones, uh, the mRNA is translated into a prohormone called procalcitonin, and then is cleaved to create calcitonin, which is packaged in these nice little vacuoles. And just like other endocrinology stuff, when the right stimuli, mainly calcium and pH, hit the cell, it's released or it's down-regulated. What the heck does this have to do with antibiotic stewardship? Question. Well, it turns out that um, other cells have the machinery to create procalcitonin, but when they're non-thyroid cells, they don't have the processing uh, machinery to cleave it into, calci into calcitonin like the thyroid cells. So in, in all these other cells, you get procalcitonin that's not cleaved, and the secretion is, uh, is just of the prohormone. And conveniently, it turns out that the things that regulate, upregulate procalcitonin. Should I just yell really loud? Because uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Uh, the things that upregulate procalcitonin are these cytokines that go up with bacterial infection. And conveniently, interferon gamma, which goes up with viral infection, tends to inhibit procalcitonin uh, production. So at least on paper, we have a nice prototype of a biomarker that should tell us whether we've got a bacterial or viral infection. Helpful. All right, I, I'm not a basic scientist, but this is actually uh, data from hamsters, not humans. Um, you can see that on this, this is, uh, this is calcitonin A levels, and in healthy hamsters, you just see it in the thyroid cells mainly, a little bit in the lung, but in hamsters that are septic, you can see secretion of this uh, calcitonin mRNA in all these cells. And we know that in all these other cells that aren't thyroid cells, calcitonin mRNA turns into procalcitonin. So you get procalcitonin secretion all over the body in response to sepsis. Uh, it's a good biomarker because as early as four hours into the uh, disease state, again, these are volunteers, presumably medical students, who are willing to let themselves take some endotoxin injection. And you can see that by six hours, procalcitonin levels were significantly increased. So it goes up pretty quick, which is helpful for us 
uh, when we want to make real-time decisions. You can see here that compared to CRP, the procalcitonin level peaks sooner and starts to drop sooner in the course of infection. So again, making it perhaps a more useful tool for us. The level correlates with the severity of illness as well. It's also a nice advantage. Uh, each of these panels represents a different type of serious infection, but here's sepsis, here's pneumonia. On the x-axis, you can see increasing levels of severity from service and this is the CURB-16 score, which is the pneumonia severity score. Uh, recognizing that these confidence intervals are pretty wide, you can still, you can still at least appreciate that the median uh, procalcitonin level goes up the sicker the patient. And then lastly, it's not impacted by immunosuppression. This is a graphic representation and, and tabular representation, but basically, if you compare neutropenic localized bacterial infection to patients with bacteremia, you can see that the pro-cal levels are higher. Um, similarly, if you compare localized infections to severe sepsis, pro-cal levels are higher. Or neutropenic, these are cancer patients before chemo. These are when they're neutropenic, and this is when they have neutropenic fever. You see about a doubling of the pro-cal level. So immunosuppression doesn't impact the levels so much. Procalcitonin level goes down when you appropriately treat the infection. So on this side, bacteremia and sepsis. In patients who are clinically responsive to therapy, you can see the procalcitonin levels drop nicely. These are patients who are not clinically responding to therapy. Procalcitonin levels stay up. So in summary, here's sort of the case for why this might make a nice biomarker, right? It's got levels that go up in response to bacterial infection and go down in response to viral infection. The levels go up quickly and drop uh, with appropriate treatment, and uh, they correlate with severity of illness un unaffected by immunosuppression. So at least on paper, it makes the case for a useful biomarker. Uh, like anything else, we got to know about the limitations of the assay. Even though this is a pretty uh, full slide with lots of potential um, confounders, I would make the argument that most of these are pretty obvious clinically to us and um, pretty easy to manage, right? So in people who have massive cellular injury where they could have procalcitonin leaking out of their cells due to severe shock or severe trauma or burns, usually we can pick that up um, on exam. Um, and um, patients who have other reasons for procalcitonin levels to be high, like with new chemotherapy and biologics nowadays where we're treating people with cytokines. Obviously, those cytokine therapies can drive up your levels, so we have to be aware of that. Um, or people who have medullary thyroid cancer where they're secreting pro-cal from their C-cells. And then uh, other forms of non-bacterial cytokine ad, uh, activation, some fungal infections, some vasculitis type stuff. The main one that I hear about from uh, the haters at my place is the chronic kidney disease. Um, it's true that like, trop like troponin, patients with CKD may, um, may have delayed excretion of, of procalcitonin, so their baseline level might be a little higher. But certainly if you have a baseline procalcitonin, you can still use it because it's still going to have the same dynamics where it goes up in infection and comes down. Um, even if you don't have a baseline, if you just follow the trends, if you really want to use it in patients with CKD, it's not an insurmountable barrier. Now that's all well and good on, uh, you know, that's the basic science stuff, but, but you want to hear about what the clinical studies show. That's what's really important to us as hospitalists, right? So I'm just going to focus on the areas where the evidence is best, specifically lower, uh, respiratory infections, pneumonia, COPD, bronchitis, and severe sepsis, septic shock, and critical illness. That's what we're going to focus on. Um, these other areas have been studied a little bit with equivocal stuff at small studies. We're not going to focus on that today. Uh, this is just a list to show that there's lots of different studies mostly supporting the use of procalcitonin as a tool for antibiotic stewardship. I'm not going to go through all these. I'm going to just kind of stick to the big studies and um, really kind of go through big picture, not get, try to get too far into the weeds. But let's start with lower respiratory tract infections. Okay. Uh, so here's a case where uh, it might, uh, with a question for you. So you have a 72-year-old gentleman with pneumonia who you've treated appropriately with antibiotics and by hospital day four, he's feeling better and stable clinically. So he's gotten four days of antibiotics. How many more days do you think he needs? Three more days for a total of seven days, six more days for 10 days, 
10 days for 14 days, or check a procalcitonin and stop when the level is 0 0.25. I'm not going to take a show of hands. You guys are all uh, medical people. You know how to take tests. Obviously, you know the answer I'm after. Um, but let's talk about the, the, the data behind that. Okay, so this is really the first big study of procalcitonin um, done in Switzerland. Um, and sorry, LRTIs means lower respiratory tract infection. Um, they, like all the other studies to follow, compared a uh, pro procalcitonin guided algorithm to decide on antibiotic use to clinical guideline based algorithm. And they found, uh, they, they, they compared outcomes of uh, how much antibiotic exposure the patients received when they had procalcitonin guidance versus guideline-based uh, approach, and consequently, the amount of time they had an adverse effect from an antibiotic, with the, the concept that if you're using procalcitonin for antibiotic stewardship, you use less antibiotics, you'll have less adverse effect. Now, of course, they also need to look at bad stuff, so they, uh, again, like most studies, use the combined outcome of all these different things, death, recurrent infection, uh, complications, et cetera. Obviously, you don't want to use less antibiotics just to find out that it uh, makes patients worse, not better. Um, I would almost never show a slide this complicated, but um, I'm going to go through it with you because every single study that looked at procalcitonin uses a version of this algorithm. So let's, let's walk through it to understand it. Along the top are the procalcitonin levels. Everyone got one drawn at the beginning of the study, and you can see that they increase as you go from uh, left to right. Right? And to simplify this a little bit, the breakpoint here is 0.25. If your procalcitonin is higher than 0.25, the study recommended that antibiotics should be given, that infection was likely enough that we would give antibiotics. If it's less than 0.25, they recommended against antibiotics. They had these extra breakpoints to say, boy, we really don't think they need antibiotics if it's less than 0.1, and you probably don't need it here. But for the purposes of simplicity, I'm a simple guy. Uh, just remember, 0.25 is the cutoff uh, for antibiotics. Now, if they recommended against the antibiotics, they allowed for the fact that you could be catching someone really early in their infection, so they checked another procalcitonin within a day, and if it was going up, then they would give antibiotics. They also allowed investigators to say, hey, if this patient's really looking sick, go ahead and give them antibiotics, but we're going to check another one, and we're going to keep after you if the, if the procalcitonin is still low. And on this side, if everyone, if they got an antibiotic because the procal was high, they checked it again a few times during the course of treatment, day three, five, and seven, and they said, hey, once it gets down below 0.25, you gotta stop, stop antibiotics, or if it drops by at least 80% from its peak value, you gotta stop. So very simply, the cutoff is 0.25 for antibiotics. You stop antibi if you start antibiotics, you stop them once it drops below 0.25, and if it's below 0.25 to start with, uh, you can check it one more time to make sure you didn't miss something. Uh, otherwise, you could recommend against antibiotics. So let's look at the people that were in this study. Um, they had mostly pneumonia patients, and their pneumonia patients were relatively sick. So class 3 or class 4 in the PSI I'm not going to go through the details of the PSI, but if it's not something you're familiar with, it's just a pneumonia severity rating school, score, and obviously uh, higher numbers are sicker patients. So they included a decent amount of relatively sick patients who you would probably think need antibiotics. Uh, they had COPD patients and, to a lesser extent, bronchitis patients. 90% uh, of the clinicians complied with the algorithm. That's pretty darn good, especially when you see some of the other studies. And not surprisingly, they found that antibiotic exposure overall was less, um, most significantly in patients with COPD and bronchitis. Again, that's not surprising because all of us struggle a lot more with whether our COPD patients, do they really need antibiotics? Is this just a COPD exacerbation? Bronchitis, you know, we never really know, but we, always, we, all, we often give in and give it. So this is COPD, this is bronchitis. The dark bars are the control group the, sorry, the dark bars are the procalcitonin guided therapy. The light gray bars are the uh, guideline based therapy. And you can see that overall for COPD exacerbations and bronchitis, they got a lot less antibiotics over time. For pneumonia, which is here, most of us aren't going to admit a patient to the hospital for pneumonia and not start antibiotics. Totally get that. And that's what this study reflected, that they usually got initial antibiotics, but you can see 
uh, that they were stopped a lot sooner than the patients who had traditional guideline-based therapy. And again, not surprisingly, adverse events from antibiotics were reduced. Uh, and most importantly, no difference in bad stuff. The combined endpoint or just mortality itself were no different. So we could, at least by this study, we could, we could use less antibiotics without harming patients. Good. Okay? So again, I told you before, there's, there's still a lot of people that, that I run into that are kind of not comfortable with procalcitonin. And one of the things they like to say is, well, that study was done in Switzerland. We don't really know how it applied to the United States. I don't quite understand how our cell biology is that different that we really have to um, worry about that. But certainly there are different in resistance patterns and organisms and microbiology. So here we go, 2018, New England Journal of Medicine basically did almost the exact same study and found no impact. So I told you before, I'm a procalcitonin lover. This concerns me. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it must be an important study. So I, I spent some time trying to dig into it because it's really curious to me how you can basically do essentially the same study. They use the same algorithm. Their outcomes were a little bit different. Their composite adverse event rate was a little bit different, included a couple of things, but essentially looked at the same stuff, antibiotic exposure and adverse events, and found no impact um, from procalcitonin. So being a curious guy and a procalcitonin fan, I wanted to know why. There's the results. So antibiotic days were the same. Adverse outcomes were no worse. So they weren't harming patients with procalcitonin, but they weren't saving any antibiotic days. So why bother? Uh, so I put the older study here. Pro-hospice was the, the first study I showed you. And the pro-act uh, on this side. The studies were so similar, they almost had the same name. Right? So one difference that I think is important is the, the way they enforce the protocol. So they were a lot stricter in the PROHOS study that if you were going to deviate from the protocol, uh, you have to let them know right away. They were going to follow up with another procalcitonin. They were going to call you. Here it was kind of like, eh, you know, here's the guideline. You're the doctor. Do what you think is best. So that's a difference. Um, and you can see that's reflected because if you look at the com compliance with the protocol in the newer study, 63% versus 90%. Now, obviously, if you're trying to prove that there's an impact from using procalcitonin and 40% of the people aren't even following the guideline, it may be a little harder to show a benefit. Uh, here's another issue that I have with the study, um, the exclusions. 80% of the patients they screened in this study were excluded. Now, that sounds worse than it is. They were, to their credit, they were trying to just get patients who there was a question like, should we or shouldn't we give antibiotics? So they were trying to get patients where procalcitonin would have really made a difference. So they spent a lot of effort trying to select those patients where the clinicians wasn't really sure. But you can see as a result of that, plus MD just saying, no, I'm not gonna do this study, uh, over a quarter of the patients were kicked out of the study just for these two reasons alone, whereas here they included most patients. But really the biggest issue with this study that makes, to me, uh, really hard to expect them to show a difference is they included a whole lot of patients who really shouldn't be getting antibiotics at all, 39% of patients with asthma. If anybody in the audience can bring up the guideline to me afterwards that shows me that asthma exacerbations are supposed to be treated with antibiotics, I'd love to see it so I can modify my slides. But there was just a study that came out this, this year that showed that patients with asthma exacerbations treated with antibiotics actually do worse. So I don't know why they included this many patients with asthma in their study. And then when you look at the other patients that they included, the pneumonia patients really weren't as sick as these patients. They mostly had PSI scores less than three. A quarter of the patients had bronchitis. So I'm not sure we're comparing apples to apples here, and it's going to be harder for these guys who included a lot of patients who probably shouldn't get antibiotics in the first place. I mean, their mean procalcitonin level, 90% of the patients in this study had a procalcitonin less than 0.25, so they weren't even going to get antibiotics anyway. So. Um, it makes it a little harder for them to show that antibiotic uh, use is reduced. They did show that, um, you know, there's no harm. Um, but there's really a big discrepancy in the benefits between this study and this study. So what do we do when we have two big studies that show something different? How do we fix this? We do a meta-analysis. This came out in 2018. And again, they used only randomized controlled trials. 
this many patients, uh, this d diverse uh, group of countries. And here they found that uh, not only was antibiotic exposure less by two and a half days, uh, antibiotic side effects were reduced. They actually were able to show that people die less often with procalcitonin guided therapy. It's a 1% difference, but it was statistically significant. So bottom line, at least by the meta-analysis, is that uh, you're not harming patients with procalcitonin. You're potentially, you're probably helping, at least with lower respiratory infections. So that's that part. Now let's tackle an even more complicated, which is sepsis, okay? So here's your case, okay? A gentleman who's transferred out of the ICU to you after five days of treatment for septic shock due to Klebsiella bacteremia from pyelonephritis. Now, um, sorry, this is not a gentleman, it's a woman, but um, she has been off pressors now for 36 hours. Her cultures are cleared, she's stable, but she's deconditioned, she needs ongoing hospitalization. Same question, how many more days of antibiotics do you do? A, Seven-day course, 10-day course, 14-day course. This is bacteremia now. Or do you stop once the procalcitonin has dropped by 80%? So if pneumonia is complicated and uh, concerning for us to try to think about not giving antibiotics or giving less antibiotics, sepsis is another level, right? I mean, we've got the surviving sepsis campaign, and we've got all these people telling us um, that we got to do all these steps to take care of our sepsis patients. Right? And we know that every hour delay in appropriate antibiotics for patients who have septic shock is going to potentially result in uh, worse outcomes. But at the same time, we know that we're not going to have our cultures at the time we need to make this decision. And we also know that there's lots of other things that create, can drive the SIRS criteria up and confuse the picture. And so again, what do we do? We want to be judicious stewards of antibiotics, but we, we also sure as heck don't want to um, undertreat sepsis. And I would say that, in general, the standard is still going to be treat first, ask questions later when it comes to sepsis and sepsis shock. I'm not here to tell you anything different. But I am going to point out, this is an editorial that just came out last year, where people are actually finally, these, the authors are from Harvard, so, you know, no slouch here. Um, they, they are at least starting to question the fact about antibiotic overuse, even in sepsis. I showed the slide mainly because of the first sentence of the article was just so beautiful. Sepsis is medicine's last remaining preserve for unrestrained antibiotic prescribing. I just love that. Uh, so they go through their arguments about how we, uh, there's room for us to start looking at opportunities to be judicious, even with sepsis. So how can procalcitonin inform that? Uh, we've already laid out the case of how it might be useful in uh, discerning uh, bacterial from non-bacterial infections. Um, Let's look at the studies. So again, here's the first big study that was done in sepsis. Actually, let me rephrase that, done in critically ill patients. Only about 45% of them truly had septic shock, but all of them were admitted to the ICU critically ill with a suspected infection, okay? So this is more accurately a study of critically ill patients with procalcitonin-guided uh, therapy. Studies were done very similar to the others I showed you. Uh, they looked at mortality and, as, as, and antibiotic exposure as their outcomes. And um, again, not all the patients had septic shock, but all of them were in the ICU. They were randomized again to a procalcitonin-guided algorithm versus usual care. The one big difference between the studies in sepsis and the studies in uh, lower respiratory infact, tract infections this should look somewhat familiar, different cartoon, but same idea. This is the algorithm where it says, uh, below this level of procalcitonin, you discourage antibiotics. Above this level, you encourage antibiotics. The big difference is they, they assume that if you're septic, if you have septic shock or critical illness, your procalcitonin is going to be pretty high. So instead of using 0.25 as the decision point for antibiotics, they use 0.5. I don't know if you can see that from the back, but the cutoff is 0.5. So less than 0.5, they discourage antibiotics. More than 0.5, they encourage the antibiotics. Once again, if it's less than 0.5 and they're critically ill, you better check another one. And then if it's still low, you're probably good. And once again, if it's high, keep checking it throughout the study. And when it drops by at least 80% or drops below 0.5, time to stop antibiotics. Now, these are the results. But first of all, I'm going to point out that in this study, adherence to the protocol was much lower than in the respiratory trials that uh, I shared with you. That does not surprise me because I am not comfortable. I'm telling you I'm a procalcitonin lover. I'm not going to withhold antibiotics in a septic patient if 
I don't care what the procalcitonin level is. I'm not at that level of comfort yet. And so you can see that adherence to the protocol was a bit lower in this study of critically ill patients. But even though adherence was lower, they were still able to show that there was less antibiotic use with no worsening of mortality. So they found the same things as they found in the, in the respiratory trials, okay? Um, however, these are critically ill patients, and at least in the academic medical circles where there's a lot of skepticism about anything new, people criticized the study because they said, well, you know, there was a trend towards a higher mortality in the procalcitonin group at 60 days. Okay, yeah, it wasn't statistically significant, and I'm trying to get my head around how if they were still alive at the same rate at 30 days, how something I decided in the first two or three days of their ICU stay impacts their 60-day mortality. But anyway, those concerns were raised, and fair enough. So uh, another study was done, twice as many patients, twice as many ICUs, basically the same design, uh, published a couple years ago. And again, same, even same outcomes they looked at. And in this study, this is survival on the y-axis, so higher is better. The red line is procalcitonin. So they were able to show a sustained increase in survival over time with pro procalcitonin-guided therapy in critically ill patients. And uh, this is probably going to be tough to read from the back, but antibiotic consumption was lower in the procalcitonin group. Uh, mortality was uh, also lower in the procalcitonin group by 5%. At 28 days, and to, to quash the concerns of the other study, also lower a year later, okay? Um, and uh, other, other outcomes were relatively insignificant. There was a suggestion of increased reinfection rates in the procalcitonin group, 3% versus 5%, 0.49, so just barely got statistically significant. But when they looked at how often they got more antibiotics and things like that, that, there wasn't actually a difference. So not exactly sure what to make of that. Again, bottom line, uh, if there's any questions in the study finding, do a meta-analysis, which is shown here. 11 studies, 4,000 patients of critically ill patients with comparing procalcitonin-supported therapy to, to usual care. And they were able to show uh, mortality benefit, no difference in length of stay, and a reduction in antibiotic exposure. So again, even in uh, critical illness, there's reasonably good data that procalcitonin guidance it can be used appropriately. The caveat here to remember is instead of 0.25, the cut point is 0.5 for initiation of antibiotics. And for follow-up antibiotics, uh, when the procalcitonin drops by 80% or more, or when it gets below 0.5, you can stop. Um, in anticipation of what questions might be coming, I'm not standing up here telling you that if you don't feel comfortable clinically, uh, that, that to, I'm not standing up here telling you to not give antibiotics to someone that you have concern about septic shock in. Uh, that's really, uh, you know, despite what these studies show, clinical judgment is always, always, always going to supersede what the number says. However, it might be very helpful in helping you with dur duration of therapy, right? So, um, just see where we're, um, there's some studies in COPD as well, but they're, they're not as robust, and, um, uh, but you might want to know what they show. Um, but the data for COPD is, is a little, um, little less strong, uh, but it comes up a lot, right? Here's a patient who is admitted all the time with COPD exacerbations. Um, he gets steroids and antibiotics every time. This time he comes in, again, with symptoms of respiratory, you know, respiratory symptoms, but also runny nose, sore throat, positive rhinovirus on the RPNA. He's admitted to manage his hypoxic respiratory failure, and you are struggling with whether or not this patient should get an antibiotic. Is it just the rhinovirus, or has he got a co-infection? We all know that the, the guidelines for COPD care suggest that antibiotics might have some benefit. So what do we do? Okay. Again, the studies here are smaller, but they show basically the same thing as the respiratory studies. Uh, this is a blinded randomized controlled trial, but only a couple hundred patients, uh, COPD patients. Uh, but again, they did the same thing, compared it to standard care, and they found that uh, antibiotic re reduction of 44% relative risk reduction in exposure to antibiotics uh, without any difference in bad things like ICU admission, length of stay, mortality, et cetera.
And then a second study that came out just this year, so I figured needs to be included. Um, this wasn't a randomized controlled trial. It was really a pre and post. This, these hospitals at Pittsburgh put in place a procalcitonin guidance algorithm, and so they looked to see how patients with COPD fared before the algorithm and after the algorithm to see if there was any improvement. And again, they showed uh, less antibiotics overall uh, and uh, shorter length of stay by about a day without worsening of readmissions. But this also came out this year, and even though there's some problems with this study, I figured uh, I should include it just so that in case you've seen it, um, this study showed that in the ICU for patients with COPD exacerbations, there was no benefit for procalcitonin-guided therapy. I will point out that, uh, again, when I see a lot of studies that show one thing and then one study that shows a different finding, I'm a little bit curious. Uh, these folks, so this was done in France, it was randomized, it was a small number of patients, um, but the cutoff they used for antibiotics was a procalcitonin of 0 0.1. Remember I told you for critically ill patients, the cutoff that all the other studies used was 0 0.5. And even for the respiratory patients, the cutoff was 0 0.25. So these guys were super, super conservative. Probably almost everybody was going to be recommended antibiotics in this study. So again, it's going to be hard for them to show that antibiotic duration is less with procalcitonin guidance when they set up the protocol so pretty much everyone's going to get an antibiotic. Again, no harm was done in this study. There was no difference in mortality. Um, but whether it truly uh, applies, I can't tell you. So COPD uh, and procalcitonin, a little bit controversial still. Um, but let's get to, let's, let's finish up with some cases. First of all, the question is, is it cost effective, right? There's been lots of different ways to look at whether it's cost effective. It really depends on how many tests you're ordering and uh, how much the test is being, is, is being billed for. But this is at least one modeling study. They, they modeled a hypothetical mil, uh, one million insured lives in an integrated de delivery uh, system. They used data from some of the meta-analyses I shared with you. And they estimated that if it's used appropriately, there's uh, upwards of $6 million of savings that could be accrued to us. Um, extrapolating nationally, that's a billion dollars in potential savings from antibiotic stewardship. So it's a compelling study. So again, the, the, the real driver for me to give this talk is that, uh, you know, at least at UCSD and I suspect at a lot of other places, uh, again, there's a lot of controversy around it, like procalcitonin is really helpful, it's not really helpful. So let me ask you, who knows what this is? Just shout it out if you know. Come on, I had a shout over this microphone. You guys can do it. Thank you, vegetable peeler. Okay, it's a tool, it's really helpful. I use it all the time in the kitchen. And uh, you know, like any tool, if it's, uh, if it's used appropriately, it can save me a lot of time feeling, peeling apples, carrots, and potatoes. But just because it's called a vegetable or fruit peeler doesn't mean that it works for every time I need to peel a vegetable or a fruit. If anyone is able to use it to peel any of these vegetables or fruit, let me know how you do it, right? The point is that all the tools are useful when they're used the way they're designed to be used. And procalcitonin is no different, right? So a lot of the people that I find uh, are not engaged with finding procalcitonin helpful, I find that they may not know how to use it as it is intended. Now, one of the arguments I hear, usually from our infectious disease folks, is we don't need another test for antibiotic stewardship. There's all this information out there that says you can use short course antibiotic therapy. And I will say, if that's the culture at your place, if you guys are already using short course antibiotic therapy routinely, good for you. Procalcitonin may have less of a role. I, I, I'm doubtful that at my place, we're all that different than at your place. Our hospitalists and our residents, you know, we finish, we treat their patients' infection, we get them better in the hospital, and it's really hard for us not to send them home without another five or six days of antibiotics, right? And so if you're still doing that like most of us, then you're not there yet. And it's not just UCSD, this is just a study that shows what we all know, that there's still a lot of antibiotic overuse. Um, so the other problem, uh, and this is stuff that you might not have seen before, but um, is are we using the test appropriately? I think that the folks that I talk to who don't find procalcitonin helpful are confused because they are surrounded by all these procalcitonins that they see ordered on their patients 
that don't really get used the way they're supposed to be used, and so they feel like the test is useful. Now, that's not really a problem with the test. That's a problem with the user. So uh, we were curious about how this looked at my place, and it probably looks the same at yours if you look. We looked at 300 plus procalcitonin tests on 200 different patients, and I was interested to see how often we were using it inappropriately. So what's inappropriate? Well, we gave it two different definitions. One definition was discordant use, right? What does that mean? That means the clinician did the opposite of what the test said to do, right? So if the procal was high and they withheld the antibiotic, or if the procal was low and they gave the antibiotic anyway, I called that discordant use, okay? And that was about a third of the use. Almost all of it, of course, was people who had checked the procalcitonin, it was low, and they were like, well, I think I'm still gonna give antibiotics. I'll tell you right now, I got no problem with that. That's perfectly appropriate. You should always use your clinical judgment above and beyond a test. But don't check a, che don't check a test if you know that you're gonna give antibiotics regardless, right? That's just wasting blood and money. So that's one definition of inappropriate use that was a third of our patients. But then we took it a step further because there were some, uh, we, we looked at just to say, what about low value use overall? Meaning the test was checked in a context where no matter what it showed, it's not gonna be clinically meaningful. So patients who are getting admiria, admitted with an LP positive for meningitis, maybe even a positive gram stain, who are getting a procalcitonin checked, are you telling me that if it's low, you're not gonna give this patient antibiotics? No, that's ridiculous, right? So there was a lot of that going on too. People just checking it because it's a cool new test that we have. So when you looked at low value use overall, meaning it's either discordant or low value the way I described it, that was two thirds of the procalcitonins that we checked at our place. So it's not really surprising to me that my residents might say, hey, this test isn't really that helpful to me. Well, you gotta, you know, this is on me as the uh, attending, but you gotta learn how to use the test the way it's meant to be used. And then you might find it more helpful. I mean, by my definition, we're, we're spending or potentially wasting uh, over $100,000 a year on low value testing. So we gotta do better than that. So bottom line is, just like this tool, procalcitonin can be useful, at least I find it useful, and you make your own decisions, in practice if it's used as intended. So I'll give you some examples of where I think it's useful. Um, if you ever admitted a patient with heart failure who also has a little bit of shortness of breath, a low grade temperature, a little bit of a leukocytosis, and some bilateral interstitial infiltrates. Gee, is that, is that fever and leukocytosis because of a superimposed infection, or is it all heart failure? How do you know? Again, procalcitonin, if you feel comfortable clinically withholding antibiotics, you might, uh, you might feel more comfortable if the procalcitonin was low in that situation. Or patient who uh, maybe has lung cancer. And so they have a baseline abnormal x-ray with a right upper lobe mass. They come in with hemoptysis, shortness of breath, and a low-grade fever, a little leukocytosis. Once again, is this post-obstructive pneumonia, or is this all just progression of lung cancer? It's kind of hard to know. Um, I, I would check a procal in this patient myself, and if it was low and I clinically felt that they weren't infected, I'd feel a lot more comfortable with holding antibiotics. And this is basically the patient I gave you in the earlier slide, the, the COPD exacerbation who maybe looks like they could have a viral infection, right? I, again, I'd be comfortable withholding antibiotics there. But here's cases where it really has no use, okay? This is a patient with classic pneumonia, shaking chills, cough, rough colored sputum, shortness of breath, temperature 102, leukocytosis, new right middle lobe consolidation. You know that patient has pneumonia. You don't need another test. So in that case, maybe you don't need it. A patient with classic symptoms of pyelonephritis. Uh, first of all, it hasn't been studied quite as extensively in, in pyelonephritis, but even, even if it has, I mean, you've got your urine culture, you've got your clinical judgment. This patient clearly has pyelonephritis. And lastly, I mean, I saw, I saw all these cases when we reviewed our charts. Patient with IV drug user whose skin pops, who comes in with a visible abscess and cellulitis on the leg. I don't think you need another test to decide about using antibiotics, right? So again, it's a tool. If it's used the way it's intended to be used, it, it can be very helpful. I would say, uh, you know, obviously uh, amongst the biomarkers we looked at, we're very comfortable with using biomarkers for heart stuff. So this is a biomarker you could get comfortable with for infection. It's not perfect. You obviously have to understand the clinical context and some of the conditions that the evidence is better for. There are some confounders, which we talked about, but most are pretty clinically obvious. And uh, of course, 
Clinical judgment should always supersede the test. I really wouldn't recommend you getting the test unless you are going to act on it. So remember, for lower respiratory infections uh, like COPD and acute bronchitis that are relatively low acuity, it can be helpful in your decision to start antibiotics, yes or no. For higher acuity respiratory infections like pneumonia, it can at least be helpful in guiding the duration of therapy. And for sepsis, more targeting the duration of therapy than whether you start antibiotics up front or not. Although if it's a, real, if it's a patient you really think is distributive shock um, or it's heart failure from heart failure, not infection, and the Procal is low and it fits your clinical judgment, you, you could potentially use it in that situation. So that's all I wanted to say on that. Uh, depending on timing, I'm happy to take questions from here or afterwards, and I really appreciate you all coming out during lunch to listen. I have a question. Would, in the last three cases you presented with the avocado, yes. would, you, would you use procalcitonin to discontinue antibiotics? Yeah. Yes, I, I think it's helpful. If it's low at whatever point on the continuum of care, I would stop antibiotics when it's low, assuming it fit my clinical impression. He had, he had a question up here. Uh, actually, I have like a lot yeah. of questions. Maybe I should just ask you after. But um, so, I, there, in terms of like atypical organisms for respiratory infections, I, I've read some different things. Like the sensitivity is not as high, and so it becomes kind of an issue sometimes. I can't tell you how many times I've uh, seen uh, like COPD exacerbations where. I'll get an organism back. Maybe it's not atypical, to be fair, but I'll get an organism back on the sputum, and the procal will have been negative the whole time. And how do you address those sorts of situations where you don't know if it's colonized or a truly an infection? Or yeah, that's a great question, and, and I, I, I didn't go into detail on that specific piece, but I'm glad you asked. You know, the, the data for procalcitonin going up in bacterial infection is really strongest for sy systemic infections. And so I think we could argue pretty pretty reasonably that you know, COPD is really more like a localized infection, right? You got, it's more of a bronchitis. And although there are some studies showing that you can safely withhold antibiotics with COPD and bronchitis, they're not as robust as for systemic infections. Um, and, you know, with COPD, it's complicated because the gold criteria suggests you should start antibiotics with a significant uh, exacerbation. And, you know, so... I, I personally still, um, if it fits my clinical impression, I would use the procalcitonin to support withholding it. Our pulmonologists support that as well. But I think you could make a case um, that you need more data on, on that specific point you made. And, and then in terms of some of the special populations, I know you mentioned CKD, but in particular, uh, in-stage renal disease. Uh, I've seen a lot of people I, I'm, you know, that have been on antibiotics and I want to stop it, but you'll check a procal and it'll be like three. And it's like, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right. The CKD data is really mostly on the end-stage renal disease, not CKD 2, 3. Um, that's where you really see uh, elevated baseline levels. If you just have one procal that's checked at the end of therapy, you're right, it's probably not going to be helpful to you if you don't have a baseline. So if you're going to use it in a CKD patient, uh, you probably want to trend it. In, in order for it to be useful. So if it was six and it went, you know, well, let's say if it was 12 and it went down to three, then you could probably stop. And that's when you use the 80% drop. Yeah. Regard that. Okay. And then I guess uh, my last question was kind of observational too. I, I, I noticed you, you went through the neutropenia and not really affecting it. And I, maybe I need to go back and look to see if they were on immunotherapy, but I've had multiple cases of, uh, um, I can think of four, actually, of neutropenic fever that have come in. Everything winds up being culture negative, but the procalcitonin level never goes down. It like, was what? It, 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 like, never drops. Like, it, oh, uh, yeah. I've had, yeah. like, three or four cases. Maybe they were on immunotherapy, and I just didn't realize it at the time. But um, it, in theory, neutropenia should not affect procalcitonin levels from... Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think we have huge yeah. amounts of data on that. You know, some of those those studies were pretty small that I showed you. Uh, but yeah, in theory, you you should still be able to see the dynamic rise and fall of procalcitonin in neutropenic patients. Have you seen it elevated in pulmonary infarcts or not? Pulmonary infarcts? Yeah. 
Um, uh, would be. You mean if it were checked in the context of thinking it was an ammonia? Yeah, wedge shaped defect appears like ammonia on X ray. Yeah, so all I can say is from, from physiologic understanding, it should not be, but uh, I, I don't know that there's any, that's, there's nothing bigger than that on the data, that's clinical data. Yeah, we had a patient with MSSC treated with, Rogel was like 50. 5-0? So 5-0, yeah. Hmm. After three days, pulmonary angio and... So he's saying he had a patient with a massive PE and a procalcitonin of 50. So I, I can say that it does get secreted in the lung. Um, and so if there was a lot of tissue damage, you could see with cell necrosis, it could be leaking out. So I, I think it makes sense physiologically that that could happen. But I guess it'd have to be a pretty good size PE. Uh, my question was about the sensitivity of the procalcitonin for sepsis. And I'm sure we've all seen clinically patients with a normal WBC who has sepsis, or you know, patient with uh, coughing and, uh, and pneumonia, but no, uh, no fever. And so I was looking at some sensitivities, um, like one study showed the sensitivity of, um, like uh, one study showed 44 44% of patients with sepsis had normal WBC. Another study showed 32% of septic patients had normal temperature. And I saw one study in UpToDate where they said the sensitivity for procalcitonin was 71% for sepsis, so 29% of sepsis patients had a normal procal. And so how do you approach um, uh, procalcitonin for sepsis and sepsis in general and in terms of finding, uh, like diagnosing those patients with sepsis early and giving them antibiotics early? Yeah. I, I still am not uh, one who would, uh, I'd have to have a very strong clinical suspicion that it was a non-sepsis shock. So if it was clearly, to me, cardiogenic shock, um, I don't know that I would necessarily need to check the procalcitonin if I really believe that strongly. Sometimes it just muddies the water. But yeah, I, I still think we're at the stage with sepsis that you, you treat with broad spectrum antibiotics and you use it more as a tool for de-escalation versus from withholding at the, fr from the get-go. I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable with that yet. It's, I don't, it sounds like you're not either and I don't, I don't blame you. Uh, very quickly, outside of septic patients, non-septic patients, I only use it for respiratory-related suspected infection, but nothing outside of respiratory system if they are not septic. Is that how you use them? Do you use them for a pure cellulitis? Sometimes the cellulitis don't look typical. I saw some people started to check it, uh, or, or pilo, as you were referring to. We just don't have data on those populations. Yeah, you're right. Hold your ground, right? Uh, I, I see people checking it at my place, too. Um, in cellulitis in particular, you know, it's, it's really intended to be, it, it goes up with systemic infections, and I, I tend to think of that more as a localized infection. Um, yeah, you're, you're correct. Keep doing what you're doing. Yep. First of all, thank you for the information. It was very helpful. Uh, my question was kind of what she was asking. Uh, it was more specific for GI. So people come in, they're, uh, we're thinking maybe it's viral gastroenteritis, but then the person has had multiple admissions recently on antibiotics, multiple abdominal surgeries. So would you use procalcitonin to guide antibiotics um, considering uh, gastroenteritis or enteritis on a CT? Uh, no, I would not. Just, I mean, you know, those studies in cellulitis too, you know, in pilo, uh, eventually they may have better data. But for now, um, what we understand it is really for... Uh, sepsis and um, and the respiratory stuff. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. If um, you can fill out those evaluations, that would be very helpful. We want to take that information back for the future. And thanks, Dr. Seaman, for this presentation. <laughs>